to you about uh, our recent insights into the structure of uh, relativistic jets. Uh, and this work is uh, done in collaboration with Ramesh Narayan and Jonathan McKinney and uh, I'm at Harvard Astronomy. Um, by the way, this works? Yeah. Oh, good. So I will be mostly concentrating on applications to gamma ray bursts because these are the most extreme jets um, uh, in, in, in nature. And so, uh, but so, but however, you can apply the results to other objects that harbor relativistic magnetized jets, such as active galactic nuclei or black hole binaries. But however, coming back to gamma ray bursts, what are they? Uh, they are, not surprisingly, bright flashes uh, in gamma rays on the sky. Uh, and they were detected by, uh, first by Vela satellite, which was a military satellite uh, launched uh, to spy on the Soviets to see if they were blowing up um, bombs, atomic bombs, on the uh, backside of the moon. Uh, or maybe uh, somewhere uh, in their territory. However, what they found is that Indeed, they did detect gamma rays. However, they weren't coming from the Soviet Union or from the backside of the moon, uh, but from all around the outer space. And uh, this is how gamma ray bursts were discovered. Uh, the military sat on the results maybe for five or six or seven years, and then they didn't find them particularly interesting, so they released the results, and uh, this created an explosion in the community. Everybody got very excited, tried to explain what these uh, events, exotic events, were. Uh, the uh, peak photon energy in these gamma rays uh, in each of the events is somewhere in between hundreds and thousands of kilo electron volts. And I will talk about it in more detail in just a second. Um, each of these events outshines the rest of the universe, or I would say bright, a brighter of these events outshine the rest of the universe in gamma rays. Uh, there are a few of such um, explosions detected per day. Uh, and uh, they are isotropically distributed, as was found out by Betsy, uh, in the 90s, uh, here you see a diagram showing uh, about 3,000 Betsy bursts color-coded by, uh, by the fluids. Uh, and you can see that they pretty much cover uniformly the sky. Uh, therefore, this was the first indication that these gum ray bursts are probably coming from, to us from, cosmologically, uh, uh, distance, from cosmological distances. Uh, and uh, later, indeed, um, more careful studies of the spectra revealed that uh, the range of redshifts uh, where these bursts occur uh, spans from very close very close to us from 0.008 to uh, the redshift all the way up to 8 which was just discovered uh, earlier this year. Um, immediately after it was realized that these bursts have to be uh, cosmological um, there, was a, there was a problem that, uh, that became very clear uh, is that if you just multiply the flux, uh, the fluence uh, in gamma rays uh, by the distance squared, essentially, to get the total energy release, assuming that the energy release is isotropic, you get an enormous amount of energy uh, over, released over the burst duration, uh, about 10 to the 54 ergs, or the rest mass of the sun, m sun c squared, uh, which prompted questions about how, what kind of object would be able to release this energy. Uh, and uh, it turns out that uh, one way of getting out of it, of, the, of this energy crisis, is to assume that the energy is emitted not isotropically, but it's collimated. And I will talk a lot about collimation in my talk. But before I do so, um, let me introduce to you the two, uh, the, the simplest classification of gamma ray bursts uh, that one can come up with. Uh, and uh, this was realized that there are two types of bursts. If you just plot the distribution of duration of the burst, uh, versus the number of bursts, then you will see that there are two well-defined peaks which are separated by, by a value of about two seconds. Uh, and so as, it, as is often in astronomy, um, the classification is very simple, short and long. Short bursts are shorter than two seconds, long bursts are longer than two seconds, and we think that the short bursts come from a coalescence of a compact object binary system. So uh, let's say a black hole is orbiting around neutron star, rather the other way around, black hole is more massive, and neutron star is orbiting around the black hole, and then they release gravitational waves, uh, the orbit contracts because the energy is lost to gravitational waves, and then finally they coalesce and form binary. It could be also a binary neutron star, neutron star system. Uh, however, we understand, we think we understand much better the lone bursts, which are believed to come uh, from the deaths of massive stars. And uh, 
this is a simulation, as it says, on the NASA website. They have a very nice code and a good team of, uh, um, uh, um, what, is the, what, is the, what is the software they use? 3DS scientists uh, who, have, who have drawn this nice movie. Um, and what, what, this, what this simulation does uh, show us is the three main components of what we think is happening in the, in the long gamma ray burst central engine. Uh, namely, uh, it, is a, it is a supergenitor star whose core collapses, forms a spinning compact object, which could be a neutron star, as was hypothesized by Duncan and Thompson, um, and uh, by Woosley uh, in 1993, who proposed that it could be a spinning black hole. Uh, no matter what the nature of the compact object is, uh, it's spinning, uh, it's deemed to be magnetized, and this magnetized rotation of the object pushes a pair of jets that get out of the star uh, and produce the observed radiation. And uh, this is what we want to understand. What is the structure of these jets? Uh, because if we understand the structure, maybe we can use the observations to infer what the properties of these jets are, and maybe what the properties of the central engine is, and maybe what are the properties of the uh, confining stellar envelope. So let's go forward. and. Uh, see what do we know about these jets. It turns out that even though these bursts are very far, cosmologically far from us, we do know quite a bit about the outflows. Um, and so here I have the cartoon depiction of the movie that I just showed you. Uh, what we have here is the same three components. We have the star, shown as a circle. Uh, we have the spinning black hole or a neutron star. I will say black hole because it sounds cooler, but it could be a neutron star as well. Um, shown with a black circle. And these lines, they show uh, the, the field lines in the plane of the board. So in principle, they could be a toroidal component as well. And here, I just don't show it. And so these lines, they, they show you the shape of the jet. And of course, it's not to scale, because the jet uh, opening angle is much smaller, as, as I'll explain in a second, than what I draw here, just for you to see the picture well. So these jets, they push through the star, as I explained, and at some distance away from the star, they produce the gamma ray radiation, which is called the prompt radiation. From the studies of this radiation, we infer that uh, the jets uh, are accelerated to enormous velocities with Lorentz factors, which are of order of hundreds, which means that the velocity, the three velocity, is 0.999949s and above uh, for many birds. Um, and I will explain in a second how, this, how, how we arrive at this. Uh, this is a hint. Uh, and also from, so, and, uh, okay, so we've produced this prompt emission. And if we let the jet propagate further out, it starts to interact with the ambient medium, the interstellar medium, or other medium, whatever you have out there, surrounding the star. Uh, and uh, it drives a shock through that medium. And the shock shines in various bands from ray, X-rays to, uh, to radio, uh, and uh, this, is, this emission is called the afterglow emission, which comes after the prompt emission in gamma rays. And by analyzing that emission, we can constrain what the collimation properties of this jet is. Uh, it turns out that there is a range of collimation angles uh, going from 2 to 10 degrees, roughly, uh, or in radians. It's on the order of 10th of a radian, or maybe less. Uh, but not only these two things do we know, and not only do we know about acceleration, collimation about these jets, but what's also exciting is that we know uh, how these two are related. And it seems uh, that, and I will show you how we know this, there is a relation between the acceleration and collimation in the gamma ray burst jets, and it is represented by the product of Lorentz factor and the opening angle being uh, in order of, on order of 10, 20, or 30 or so. So the Lorentz factor is 100, opening angle is roughly 0.1, so your product of them is 10 or so, but what we, what we say is that it's order of 10 or larger. So that's very important, and uh, a model of a gamma ray burst jet better uh, describe, agree with all of these three observational properties. Uh, why, why am I bringing all this up is that uh, there, was, there, were, there were simulations published just earlier this year that showed convincingly that any jet that I drew, like that I drew here for you, collimating jet, will always have this product less than one or so. And so there was this contradiction. Uh, on the one hand, uh, observations tell us that 
this product is larger than 10 or so, and the simulations tell you that this product is less than or equal to 1. And uh, uh, there were various speculations. Um, maybe the observations are misinterpreting the data. I mean, the, uh, the data is misinterpreted, and uh, this is not really what's going on. Alternatively, maybe there is something missing in the model, and this is what I will show you. Um, actually, the models can naturally reprodu reproduce this observational fact. And the hint, just to tell you, is to take into account the fact that actually the jet, once it gets out of the star, it's no longer collimated. It opens up, and this has to be self-consistently modeled. So I will tell you about the first such model, which uh, is uh, an APJ letter submitted and available on archive. Is the uh, uh, this is all MHD work. Yeah. His work is called MHD. Uh, his work is essentially called MHD as well as my, my work. So we assume that the gas or the plasma is magnetized but cold. So uh, the temperature is zero essentially. Is he recovering and modified the micro scaling or the original? Uh, no. Uh, and let's talk about this later. Okay. I, I have. Uh, I can talk about this for a very long time, uh, and it's very exciting. But let's talk about this at the end of the talk. Is it, is it okay? No, because we had the same result. With, we had the 2004. We had the same result. I'm just wondering. Oh, really? Know. Okay. Then, ah, I'm sorry. I should have, I should have, yeah, I'm not aware of that work. Okay. okay let's let's talk sure about this. How different it is. Okay, okay. Yeah, maybe there is some difference. Okay. Good. So before I go on further, let us uh, let me give you an idea of what the magnetized jets do in order to accelerate. What is the mechanism of acceleration? For that, let's uh, study a very simple model that, however, gives you a good intuition of what's going on. So um, let us uh, idealize a spinning compact object as a perfectly conducting sphere, drawn here. It's uh, it's spinning around the vertical axis, uh, and uh, let's uh, attach a field line to it. Uh, the other end of the, of the line, let's attach to the ceiling, uh, which will model the M medium. And let us wait for N rotations of this central object. Uh, what will then we have is we will have uh, N loops of magnetic field. Does anyone notice anything wrong about this diagram? Well, of course, uh, the attachment point shouldn't have moved from the right to the left. This is just a check of how my audience has fallen me. Okay, so uh, apart from that, uh, everything else is uh, correctly depicted on the qualitative level. And what we have is that we have from a single vertical field line, we've gotten uh, N toroidal field loops. And of course, the original uh, field, uh, vertical field is still in there. However, the longer we wait, the more loops will be there. And the larger the pressure V phi squared over 8 pi associated with this toroidal field component will be. Eventually, it will overtake the poloidal pressure, I mean, meaning the pressure associated with the original field line. And so in order to keep this uh, structure stable, you will have to support it from the sides and from above. So the ceiling will be pushed up, the sides will be pushing uh, sideways, and so you have to support the system. If we wait longer, um, uh, the jet will finally win and the ceiling will give in. Uh, and uh, this magnetic spring, we essentially created a magnetic spring, will expand vertically. Uh, and uh, this toroidal pressure will be released, and the spring will be accelerated upwards due to the gradient of toroidal magnetic field pressure. So, um, how can we understand this even simpler? By noting that toroidal field is larger than, than the vertical field, we can um, um, think of this structure as uh, toroidal loops which is sliding up this original field line as, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a ra as, as the rails that, that these uh, loops are traveling along. So these loops are traveling along this, this kind of uh, directory, or so whatever you can call it. Uh, they're, expanding along, uh, they're expanding due to their own toroidal pressure, and uh, this pressure is what accelerates them. So as they go out, they accelerate to larger and larger velocities. And uh, since these are toroidal loops, uh, the fluid, the plasma, uh, doesn't have any other chance other than to sit on this loop and move together with it at the same velocity. So the picture is very simple. You have the central object that, that emits the toroidal loops. These loops uh, have to go somewhere because they're more and more produced. And then they um, move away from the object. 
and accelerate due to the pressure gradient uh, of these loops themselves. Okay, so that's very simple. So this is the structure that I will be studying, and in order to make it um, um, uh, to make it self-contained, what I will do, I will put a wall that determines the the shape of the boundary, and this will be my model of a jet. It's a very it's a very simple setup, but it, it's very rich and it gives you insight into many uh, phenomena. So uh, let me give you some uh, explanations for why those observational facts that are listed on the first page, uh, why we think that, that, uh, that these facts are true and how do we derive them. So this is again this very simple cartoon depiction of our system. We have the central star, uh, the progenitor star. We have the compact object which is in the middle, it's spinning. And there is a jet that's uh, getting, making its way outside of the star and propagating. Uh, the vertical axis uh, scale will be, will be measured uh, in the units of the stellar radius, which is about 10 to the 10 centimeters. So this is one stellar radius. This will be 10 to the 4 and maybe 10 to the 8 and so on as we go on further and discuss different aspects of the jet. So first, uh, as the jet makes it out of the star, maybe at about 10 to the 4 stellar radii, something happens inside the jet. Some instability or some internal, um, some internal um, clock tells it to produce gamma rays. And it shines in gamma rays. And uh, this is the spectrum we detect. So this is the number of gamma ray photon as a function of photon energy uh, on the log-log plot. And the energy scale goes from uh, uh, 0.01 MeV to 1 MeV to 100 MeV. And you can see that E squared and E um, spectrum peaks at around 1 MeV, as I told you uh, on the first slide. Uh, what we can clearly say about the spectrum is that it's clearly, it clearly is non-thermal. Um, it's, it's, it's two power laws stitched together. And uh, just based on this argument, uh, we can already uh, recover the first of the GRB facts, which I will be listing on the right, remember? The, the jets move relativistically fast, they collimate it, and the product of Lorentz factor and open angle is tens. It's, it's not sure it's too far about the silver about the tens factor. Okay, yeah, so I'm making it simpler than, than what it actually is. Uh, there, is, con there, is a, there is quite a bit of controversy whether this is all there is to it. Maybe there is some thermal component somewhere, maybe there is a power law tail which is uh, not really attached to these uh, two power laws. Uh, but for the sake of argument, if I just say that uh, the spectrum is non-thermal, if it's non-black body-like, uh, then all of this applies. Okay. So if the spectrum is non-thermal, uh, th then uh, the emitter has to be optically thin. Uh, if the emitter is optically thin, then the optical depth uh, uh, to a process of uh, uh, to the falling process, when we take two gamma photons that we observe, um, when they interact. Um, and produce an electron-positron pair, uh, the optical depth of the process should be less than unity, or better, much less than unity, because otherwise the spectrum would be thermal. Uh, we can write down uh, the optical depth to the process in a very simple form. Uh, so there is some numerical factor of order unity times the cross-section, which is uh, Thomson electron cross-section, uh, uh, the density of gamma-ray photons in the Kamuvian frame times the uh, times the so velocity of gamma ray photons times the, times the characteristic distance. And if we plug in the values for this, uh, characteristic values, then we get a value which is uh, certainly not much less than one. It's uh, on the contrary, 10 to the 15 or so. Uh, and this is, this is coined compact, compactness problem. You want something to be... Your energy is MeV, and I'll talk about 100. It gives you a west frame energy of 10 KV, which wouldn't be able to produce. So why do you have to worry about this? Sorry? He's talking about right, right next to the black hole. Or yeah, some way deeper end. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, He's talking about... Uh, not, 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 not division, not in division. Yeah. Yeah. He's, He's talking about no, 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 no. Right so I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, can you can you state a question? What's the answer? You said gamma was 100. Yeah. Well, so he's giving you the justification why gamma is 100. Oh, so I, I don't yet know. So what I'm showing now is how do we know that gamma is 100 or larger? Okay. So if we assume that uh, the, the, the fireball is, uh, is not moving towards us, uh, it's stationary and producing gamma rays, uh, then, uh, and this is why I mentioned Kamuvin and that I removed that, okay, because there's no Kamuvin. Everything is sitting at rest. Uh, 
then if you just compute naively what the optical depth would be, then it's huge. But now it turns out that this problem can be alleviated, and this is the answer to your question, if uh, this whole system, this fireball that's emitting gamma rays, uh, is moving towards us with a relativistic Lorentz factor gamma, because there is a factor of gamma to the minus 6 that multiplied this value to 15. Uh, if you just self-consistently take into account for the bulk Lorentz factor motion. And uh, here you can see then, if your optical depth has got to be one or less, then you have to plug in a value here, which is uh, between 100 and 1,000 maybe, uh, or maybe larger, if you want lower optical depth. Therefore, uh, just based on such a simple and robust analysis, you can conclude what Lorentz factor should be. And uh, Lithwick and sorry, um, these guys, uh, they've, uh, um, they've, they've gotten, have you, have you met them? Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Come on. <laughs> okay. So these these two guys they have uh, they've used this uh, this and maybe more sophisticated versions of this argument to to show that Lorentz factor is larger than 400 for a, for a few bursts out of 12 that it, they considered. Maybe I think it was 12. Okay. So let's see why you get gamma bigger than 400. I would have thought that if the Lorentz factor bigger than 10 the peak energy shifts down to 100 kV and you don't bear produce because you're below the production energy, would you? Mm -hmm. uh, so, let's see. It's not enough to shift your peak, you have to shift the high energy tail. And the second you make the first couple pairs, then That's you start back scattering. Those are, so you, you can, yeah, you can, you can play around with this argument uh, at any part of the spectrum, as Avery said, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so now let's move on forward. So this is, I will check off the first fact, we've confirmed it. Now we'll talk about the last two, collimation and uh, the product of Lorentz factor and open integral. Um, so how do we know about these? Uh, if, we, if we wait longer, then uh, the jet propagates out, and as I mentioned, it starts to interact with the external medium and drives a shock into the external medium and uh, accelerate, and, sorry, and decelerates because more and more ambient medium is piled up by the jet so uh, it has to move slower because it has to accelerate all that uh, piled up stuff. Um, I think you're missing the most important one. Is that the bonus factor, the range of bonus factor is between 100 and 10,000. In order to get into the emission of the bonus factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the only way you can fit any of the JRB front emission. So I, I don't... <coughs> Yeah, but that's if you believe in your little shots. No, 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 no. It doesn't have to be into little shots. It's just uh, no. if you look at the RMSD jets or the RMSD simulations, you couldn't get better fit if you don't have a wide range in the uh, bonus factor for a given jet. I think that depends sensitively on your emission models, emission scheme. Yeah. See, this. Depends on the shock efficiency. Uh, they they, they could be. That assumes well, you're producing your emission from shock. Let, let, us, let us carry over this discussion offline. So, of course, there is much more to, 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 the, to the problem than what I am putting out on my slides. And, of course, there could be a bunch of emission models. For instance, there could be magnetic field reconnection involved, which will be powering the emission. And that will maybe require something else. So that's what I'm trying to get at. So, we get the solution mechanism. We try different solution mechanisms. So, there's reconnection or shocks. Let's go on there. We yeah. just get rid okay. of the so, but this is, okay, so this is, this is good, but what I'm saying is that it's pretty clear that Lorentz factor is large. You agree with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. That's, what, that's all I need. Now, let's, let's not talk about these controversial details. I mean, they, they, might, be, they might be clear, uh, but they're not necessary for my point. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make now is I'm trying to see what happens to this uh, shock dynamics as it decelerates, as it interacts with the external medium. How does it Lorentz factor change, and how does the open angle of the jet change? And how is that manifested uh, in terms of the life curve that we see? Because we want to understand. You're assuming the reflecting boundaries. And no reflecting boundaries so no. far. Just just uh, simple afterglow modeling calculation. Uh, and this is, by the way, called afterglow. <coughs> just to reiterate. Re re it turns out that uh, you can uh, you can uh, construct a very simple model of the dynamics of this decelerating jet, and you can show that its opening angle will almost stay the same as a function of time, as the jet decelerates. However, its Lorentz factor will be going down as a power law of the observer time t. So if you multiply variable Lorentz factor times the constant open angle, you still get the same dependence. t to the minus 3, 8, you can derive it uh, from, from very simple calculation. 
And uh, what it turns out is that this decelerating uh, jet produces a very characteristic power law uh, light curve as a function of time. So this is a log of the flux, and this is the log of the time. This is one day, 10 days, and 100 days after the prompt emission in gamma rays. And what you can see is that uh, these data points, they follow one single power law until about one day, or sorry, until about 10 days, or sometimes it's one day, and then there is a break, uh, and the light curve steepens as a function of time. This is called a jet break, and uh, it occurs when this product of Lorentz factor and open angle uh, becomes one or so. Uh, so why does this break occur? Uh, this is a small calculation that I showed on this uh, uh, hydro lunch, fluids lunch. When we have uh, a jet, let's say, uh, with an open angle of theta, and then the product of open angle and the Lorentz factor is, let's say, four. Uh, and the jet break will occur when this product becomes one. Why is that so? It's because when the jet is moving at such a fast Lorentz factor, uh, so the beaming angle is smaller than the full open angle of the jet. Then the observer on the right only sees part of the jet, which is uh, whose open angle is the beaming angle, one over gamma, smaller than the full open angle. As you go further in, in time, and this value drops down to, let's say, two, you start seeing a larger fraction of the jet. Uh, when it becomes one, you start seeing the full cross-section of the jet. And this is what your light curve is doing. It's going down as a power law in time the problem is kind of self-similar. You see a larger, larger fraction of the jet. However, once you reach this value of one, uh, then at the next time when gamma theta is one half, the observer will start seeing the edge of the jet, which is, uh, which is manifest in the light curve as a break. And therefore, so we know the time when this product of Lorentz factor and open angle is equal to one just by looking at the light curve. Coming back. This is our light curve. This is where the break is. We know that Lorentz factor times the open angle is one there. And we know how this quantity scales as a function of time. It's a power law. So extrapolating back to the beginning of the afterglow light curve, uh, we know what the value, uh, what this quantity, what the value of this quantity was. And it turns out to be of order of tens. Very simple calculation. Therefore, we know we reproduce this fact that the product of Lorentz factor and open angle is 10, 20, or 30. So, so that's actually for constant. For constant density medium, yes. If you do it for, for you know, maybe stellar wind, you get something very similar. Um, further, you can actually take this argument uh, onto the next level of detail, and you can actually model um, what the light curve would look like. And this is what was done in this paper, for instance, by Brad Senko uh, earlier this year. Uh, this is, by the way, for the naked eye burst, which you could see with your eye in the optical, very bright. I think somebody discovered it by just seeing a new star and ran up his, uh, his fellow, uh, fellow scientists at the telescope, and then they figured out that it was actually a new GRB that went up. I'm not sure if the if this story is true. Yeah, but it's plausible. Who knows? Nice story it is. So uh, what's, what, what's here? Here they fitted this, this uh, solid line is the fit that they have to their model, and it's a, fit, it's a fit that requires the open angle of seven degrees. You can do something similar for other verse. And you can get a range of open angles from maybe 2 degrees, which is 0.04 radians, to maybe 0.2 radians, which is about 10 degrees or so. So we've uh, reproduced this second fact. Uh, we see how it, uh, where it appears from, that the jets are colony. Now, let's come and see what the problem is, what I announced, that I announced initially, is that while observations uh, tell us convincingly that this product of Lorentz factor and open angle is tense, simulations tell us that it's on order of 1. So why is this so? Does this mean that we cannot reproduce the observations by using the uh, models of magnetized jets? So it means that the jets cannot be magnetized? and They have to be accelerated into a different mechanism? No. Uh, but let's first, and I will tell you why, uh, but let's first try to understand why the origin of this constraint. Why did uh, these people see that this product in their simulations is so small. The reason is very simple. It is connected to the uh, communication across the jet. So uh, let me, let me uh, show you that, that. So this is a carton of a jet. Uh, and this is the jet axis. I only show you the right part, the right half of the jet. So this is the axis of the jet. This is the right part of it, right half of it. And uh, uh, this is the jet boundary. So this is the last field line. There is no more jet material outside. And let's consider a different field line. So this is field line B. 
and there is a field line A which is somewhere in the body of the jet, somewhere in the middle of the jet. Uh, so what I will argue to you now is that communication across the jet is essential. So point B has to be able to talk to point A in order for the jet to be able to collimate. Because what happens if point B cannot talk to A? Then A doesn't know anything about the fact the boundary is collimating and uh, this uh, field line will just go straight and hit the boundary. Therefore, uh, point A has to know about point B collimating. Therefore, the boundary has to, main, has to maintain causal contact with the rest of the jet. What is the condition for that? Well, uh, let's see uh, where do the signals emitted by point B go to. They are beamed in the open angle uh, psi um, equal to 1 over gamma. It's just the beaming angle. Uh, therefore, the condition for this point being able to, to talk to this point, this point, and the point at the jet axis in particular, is that this angle xi should be larger than the open angle of the jet. So xi should be larger than theta, where theta is, uh, is the open angle. And from here, clearly you can see gamma times theta is less than 1. So this is why in the simulations of such collimating jets, you always get the product of Lorentz factor and open angle, which is less than unity. However, it is clear that as soon as I drop the assumption of the jet that is collimating, if I say collimation stops at this point and the jet just coasts straight, there is no more requirement of, of causal connection across the jet. Uh, field lines can stop talking to each other because they're going straight and there is no collisions possible. And this is what I did, and this is what I will show you in a second. It turns out that in, indeed uh, this condition is no longer satisfied and uh, you get good agreement with observations. So this is a, a setup of this uh, simplified problem when the jet is continuously collimating. Uh, and uh, I, let me tell you a few words about the numerical approach. Um, I solve numerically time-dependent uh, ultra-relativistic magnetohydrodynamic equations. And I just say ultra-relativistic here just to sound cool because if they're relativistic, then of course they work in ultra-relativistic regime as well. Uh, what else do I do? I assume that this uh, uh, jet is axisymmetric, so nothing changes as a function of phi, uh, which is a simplification, but uh, this is a first study, so we will drop axisymmetry assumption later. Uh, we also assume perfect conductivity of plasma, uh, and we assume that the plasma is cold, that is, we set temperature to zero. Uh, so what is the problem set up? I uh, put a perfectly conducting sphere in the middle, I spin it with a frequency omega which corresponds to the frequency of maximally spinning black hole and I can discuss in detail after the talk what I mean by that. I put a wall of a given shape uh, which is the shape of my jet um, and uh, we uh, choose that shape to be parabola which is reasonable. Uh, how is that wall implemented? Like a uh, it's a conducting boundary. It's a perfectly conducting boundary that doesn't let field lines go through. So whatever pressure is required to keep them together, the wall supplies. So within the simulation, once I run the simulation, uh, so essentially, yeah, so I put the walls, uh, I spin the bottom up, and I stick the field lines, field lines in, and I'll show you a movie in a second what happens. Uh, so what I get is that, that Lorentz factor times the opening is actually 2. It's not 1, it's 2, but it's still under 1. Uh, and uh, why do I want the wall to be collimating like this? Is because, uh, well, it's generic that jets have some power law shapes. For instance, this is, a, this is a, an example of a hydrodynamic simulation of a jet that's propagating through a star uh, by Jane. And you can see that the jet boundary, actually can barely see it on top of my uh, carton model, uh, there, is, there is a pretty well-defined jet boundary. Uh, it's collimating as roughly power law. But then there is a component that's missing in the simple model, that once you get to the edge of the star, then the jet opens up. And that's the second model that I will show you, uh, is the one where the wall starts to collimate just around where we expect the edge of the star to be. Once it decollimates, interesting things happen, and uh, this product of Lorentz factor and opening angle magically increases by a factor of 10. Uh, so, before I go to show you movies, I always have this because I always forget. So I need to tell you how good I am, right? How cool I am and so on. So let me tell you how hard it was to solve this problem. It was really hard. Uh, why is it hard? 
because the jet is very highly magnetized. If I want to get to a Lorentz factor of 100 or 500, and you will see it was it is 500 or even 1,000 far away, uh, then I need to start with a magnetization which is equal to the Lorentz factor uh, far away. So magnetization is 1,000. What does it mean? It means that the ratio of magnetic energy density to rest mass energy density is 1,000. Why is evolving such system hard? It's because if I make an error in magnetic field evolution, which is 1% in terms of magnetic energy, that error will carry, carry uh, over into the error in my rest mass energy density as 1% of a big value, which will be maybe 100% or 1,000% of my rest mass energy density, which is tiny compared to the, to the magnetic field energy. Therefore, I need to ensure that the errors in magnetic field evolution are very small less than a fraction of a percent, maybe 10 to the minus 6 or so. This requires high resolution. Uh, and uh, not, only, not only is this one, re this is not the only reason why this problem is hard. I also will want to evolve this solution over 10 orders of magnitude uh, because I want to get as far as the afterglow region, which is about 10 orders of magnitude uh, above this, the surface of the black hole. And so I want the cumulative errors in my solution as it evolves to be smaller than 10% or so. So that, that makes it even harder. So what do I do in order to alleviate these problems and to make such simulations possible? I use a grid that collimates together with the jet. Uh, so it follows the jet shape. Uh, not only does it improve the accuracy of the numerical algorithm, it also uh, uh, increases the resol effective resolution I have across the jet. Essentially, I always have the same number of cells across the jet because my grid follows the jet. And so I use the resolution of about 2,000 times 300 cells, 2,000 along the jet, and 300 across the jet. Uh, and if I were to use a grid that was not collimating together with the jet, let's say I were to use a monopolar grid, uh, straight, straight grid lines, then since the jet collimates and the grid doesn't, then eventually I will not be resolving the jet at all. All of the grid will be outside the jet. And that would require me to use a resolution which is 2,000 times 100,000, even million or 10 million grid cells. And I would never be able to complete this. So all of these, uh, um, all of these, uh, uh, all of these um, factors are very important to take into account when you're simulating such systems. Finally, one very important uh, aspect of this simulation is that I only evolve the part of the system that is time unsteady. What happens is, you, as you will see, once I spin up the central object, it sends off a wave. Uh, behind the wave, the solution is stationary. In front of the wave, it's also stationary because it doesn't know about the wave approaching. And so I evolved this moving window just around the wave, which, is, which allows me to take larger time steps because I don't evolve um, regions near the black hole. And uh, that gets me a speed up of about a factor of 1,000, or maybe 10,000 even. Uh, so otherwise, I wouldn't be able to, to complete the simulations. So now let me show you the pretty movies. So you see two movies side by side. This is the continuously collimated jet. And this is the deconfined jet, as I will call it. Uh, the vertical axis, I will tell you what the colors are in a second. The vertical axis is uh, um, measured in the distance, uh, in the sizes of the star, in the, in the star radius. So this is one stellar radius, R star, three and five. The horizontal scale is uh, from one fifth of the stellar radius to one fifth of the stellar radius. So one thing to keep in mind is that this picture is stretched in this direction by about a factor of 10. <laughs> So the jet's open angle is about two degrees. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, second thing is uh, I show, um, so this, the wall is shown with this uh, last so thick solid line, white line, and this hashing indicates that the wall is there. Uh, the field lines uh, in the plane of the board are shown with white lines. Uh, and color shows the Lorentz factor, actually the log of the Lorentz factor. Uh, blue shows you Lorentz factor of one and red shows the Lorentz factor of 1,000. And so in this simulation, you see this outgoing wave. Uh, solution before the wave is stationary, after the wave is stationary. And you can see that the solution after the wave uh, develops a Lorentz factor maybe of 100. See, this yellow color is about 10 to the 2. So what we get at, at about the distance of a star is Lorentz factor of about 100. On the contrary, let's take a look at the simulation of a deconfined jet. Until the size of the star, our star, the solution looks the same. It has to be the same because the shape of the wall is the same that I put in. Until about the radius of the star where I open the wall up. 
And there you see that jet structure changes dramatically. Uh, this opening up of the wall leads to an increase in, on Lorentz factor uh, by about an order of magnitude. So from, from yellowish, 100, it goes into the red region, which is about 1,000. So this just a simple open up, this change of geometry creates uh, an abrupt burst of acceleration that the jet undergoes. So where would the alpha surface be? The Elvin surface is deeply unresolved. The Elvin surface is, uh, uh, is at the distance from the, from the axis uh, of four radii of the black hole, which is uh, less than a pixel on the screen. It's, it's 10 to the minus 5 uh, uh, of, of, of this scale. So you don't resolve the alpha I do. Since my grid goes down, and it's logarithmic in radius, which I didn't mention, uh, I do resolve the Elvin surface and the, the surface of the uh, conducting sphere, which models my black hole. What are you thinking of? So in that star, I can imagine the star providing a boundary condition for the jet. Now outside, the left side, you envision that there is a wall anyway. Yes. In the vacuum somehow, magically. Right. Well, this was, uh, this was the simplest way you could model a jet. You just put a power law function uh, for the shape of the wall and just run the simulation without worrying about what actually happens in, in reality. It's a good enough approximation, you might think, because, well, maybe the wall, when the wall become, disappears, then maybe the jet just coasts. It doesn't change its Lorentz factor drastically. Its open angle probably stays the same. So whatever I measure here, Lorentz factor of 100, an open angle of 0.02, is what I will get if the wall were to go away. That's what, what people thought. But what I did is I showed that if you actually do that, then Lorentz factor from here inside the star um, to twice the stellar radius changes dramatically. Just a factor of two change in distance and your Lorentz factor increases by a factor of five. That's what you see here. Where does that energy come from? This energy comes from the energy of magnetic field because uh, all of these field lines which I draw straight, these are not the actual field lines. The actual field lines are tightly wound. What I show you is the streamlines along which these uh, field loops, toroidal loops that I mentioned initially slide. Okay, so there is a lot of energy in toroidal field which cannot be released easily. It turns out that this open up suddenly lets you release this energy because uh, the system lets, can expand faster and if you expand the flow faster then it accelerates. The left side you're converting D squared into, um, into gamma model. Yes. I convert the magnetic energy into kinetic energy. That's right. So B squared was the gamma ball on the left yes. side. And, for the time, and you're saying that by the time you reach the green line, um, most of the, the energy in B squared is still much larger than gamma ball. Yes. I can show you the picture. It's, it's a factor of 10 larger than, than, than camera. Yeah. So have you checked intermediate cases? The, Sorry? Have you checked intermediate cases where the transition is, is slower or whether the boundary outside the star you know, is, is not? So um, maybe you're asking what would happen if I take this wall and curve it like this, or like just no, move it. No, no, move no, it. just make it intermediate. So, so if I were to change the parameter, the collimation parameter, uh, so I guess here the shape of the wall is z is equal to r to the alpha. Mm -hmm. And then if I were to change this alpha for various values, so here alpha is. Uh, is about uh, 1.67 um, for the simulation for because it's 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 a good rally for certain reasons. So for the one on the left. For the one on the left, yes. But uh, I could I could choose it to be equal to two or to 1.3. That's what you're asking about. Okay. It turns out that the results are pretty much insensitive to the value of alpha that I pick, with one exception, is that this value of alpha is what sets your opening angle because the larger the value of alpha, the more collimated the solution is. Right? Z is larger for a given R. And the opening angle will be smaller at a given distance. What, what I meant more was what you do outside the star. OK. It's, of, it's basically a cone outside the star here, right? Yeah, it's a cone. It's almost so suppose you have alpha. Suppose your alpha decreases smoothly. Decreases? Smoothly. Well, you have a discontinuous change in alpha. Oh, I see. Yes. Right? It's actually a smooth change. It's a, it's a change over this distance. So, so huh? So it's a smooth change in alpha. It's a smooth change in alpha, yeah. So I smoothed it out over this distance. And if you make alpha outside the star a little bit larger than unity, it doesn't make much difference. 
if I make alpha or oh well so what what matters is that it stops collimating and uh, opens up a little bit more than uh, than than straight. Can I ask a, a, a simple question? Whoa, 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 whoa. So, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let, let me. Part of this, which huh? is, uh, uh, this is a simple question, uh, which is if you have uh, z going as r to the one point one. Yes. Outside the star, so it's it's still. If Z, Z's are one point one. Oh, okay, I see. It's still culminating, but not quite. You know, not nearly as much as it was inside the star. I don't know the answer to this question. I, I should I should check. It's it's. I mean, what I, what I was just interrupting you on was a, where it was just. just you were saying you have to have a little bit of decolonation outside the star. Oh, actually, okay. So I think, no, I, I, I think, yeah, okay. So um, if, you, if you stop collimation yeah. uh, in some way, it will still accelerate, but not as much. Right. Okay, it won't release as much magnetic energy as it does in this case. In the limiting case, when I don't change alpha at all, there is no extra release. If you, if you decrease it, then there will be some extra release. The uh, maximal release happens when I just remove the wall, which means that I set alpha essentially to one or less than one. Okay. In this particular case, what is alpha outside the star? Um, alpha outside the star here smoothly changes. Uh, it goes through one here. Asymptotically. Asymptotically, it doesn't matter. Uh, once, the wall, once the wall opens up a little bit, then since the jet is moving very fast, the beaming angle, one over gamma, is very small. And this is the... 1 over gamma is the maximum change that the jet can change its open angle by. So once my wall opens up by more than a factor of, by more than 1 over gamma in angle with respect to straight, uh, then the jet will separate from the wall. And this is what you see. The wall has changed by more than a factor of 1 over gamma, or by more than 1 over gamma in angle. And you see this black stripe. This is a vacuum. So the jet is disconnected from the wall completely. No signals travel between them. And if I were to curve this wall more, uh, or even more, or totally remove it, the solution would stay very similar to what I, I show here, essentially the same. Effectively, what's happening here, as I tell me if I'm wrong, what's happening is once you take the wall away, the jet can begin to expand sideways. And so the velocity that you see is is the, the sum of the original acceleration along the jet, which is what got you up to 100, plus this additional component of acceleration sideways. So that's not it at all? No, uh, it's, not, it's not that, no. Well, can you explain then why is Lorentz factor maximized in the decolonating jet at the edge, whereas it's maximized in the middle, or not in the middle, but, but, but at some finite distance out from the center in the, uh, in the crystal? Sure. So what happens is there is a refraction wave launched. Imagine that the wall was collimating perfectly, and then I, I, I started to decollimate at exactly this point. Then this point will start shot around. Look, the wall is going away. The wall is going away. And then uh, where does the signal get propagated to? It's this Mach, Mach cone, right? So uh, this, this beaming angle. So this is the beaming angle. And uh, the shape uh, is maybe roughly like this. So only this part of the jet knows that the wall started to open up. This part doesn't know. And you can see that this part is the same as, as this part here. So indeed, um, not all of the jet knows. This one doesn't know. And uh, as this information propagates into, into the axis, uh, then um, the jet starts to accelerate, essentially. So it's basically acceleration by the longitudinal gradient of the phi squared? Uh, it's acceleration. Well, it's still, yeah, b phi drops down. Mm -hmm. Why does B phi drop down along the field line? It's because these field lines, they diverge away from each other. And I have a slide on that since you asked. Let me show you. Here. So this is a complete analogy, incomplete analogy to a hydrodynamic acceleration in a nozzle. So uh, let me go, go to hydro for a second, just to draw an analogy. Uh, let's say the flow is moving from left to right. Uh, here at the green surface, it becomes sonic. So it crosses the sonic surface, where velocity of the flow is equal to the sonic speed, Cs. And then here on the right, velocity is larger than Cs, and the left is less than Cs, subsonic. Uh, if you're in the subsonic regime, like in the jet planes, in the nozzle, the nozzles always open up um, downstream because of the following reason. 
as you increase the cross section, then the flow dilutes. Because there is the cross section larger, the amount is the same, pressure has to drop. Uh, so the further out I go, the larger the cross section, the smaller is the pressure. So P1 is larger than P2. Therefore, there is a force which is equal to the minus pressure gradient that pushes you up. This is how supersonic flows accelerate in hydrodynamics. The same mechanism works in uh, magnetic flows with one modification that I will draw on the board and have a slide for that. Yeah. Um, but the modification is already non-trivial. Well, look, here I decollimate. The jets are collimating, so how can I have a nozzle where I have decollimation inside of a collimating jet? It turns out it's, and this is what we realized this, this year, it's a totally new hot phenomenon. This is an, a decollimation inside of collimating jet. Um, the central field lines bunch up towards the axis, and uh, these exterior field lines can expand at the expense of these ones being squished inside. So this is the nozzle. This is the open up. This is what this is how jets accelerate while they're continuously confined. Even even no no removal of the wall or anything. Now let's say I remove the wall here. Uh, then the jet will will open up even more. I mean these field lines, this field line and this field line will diverge even more. And according to this mechanism the pressure will drop even more because the cross because the area between these two field lines increases. And this is what creates acceleration near the wall, which is largest. Uh, then this field line will feel the boundary uh, disappearing a little bit later, and will also start to, uh, these field lines will start to, to expand away from each other. And this is why acceleration is, uh, is picking up later, uh, further away from the wall. This is, this is the mechanism of this acceleration. Uh, is that clear? What's the what is the B5 profile? Uh, from the axis. What's the uh, from the axis. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's, it's, dec it's decreasing. Uh, it's, it's about 1 over R, I think. Yeah, it's about 1 over R. Yeah. Uh, it's not exactly 1 over R. Because if it was 1 over R exactly, uh, then uh, the, the current would not, the, the jet will be current free, right? Yeah. So it's a, the, the jet does, car, does carry current. Uh, it's not exactly one over R. It's slightly steeper than. It's slightly what? It's slightly. I'll have to. I'll have to think about it. But I think it's it's around one over R. But it's slightly deviant, so that the jet does carry some finite amount of current. Okay. Uh, where does the momentum conservation end up? Because normally you would say once you leave the star, then you're going at gamma at gamma roll as the momentum flux is carrying out, and any energy still trapped in the field. Um, you know, in order, in order to convert that into the net momentum, requires you to back react against the surface in a nozzle, in a jet, air, in a jet nozzle, rocket nozzle. The momentum is reacted against the nozzle itself, which, which is forward. But now you're saying, oh, that is now if I have no back reaction surface, you want to increase your momentum. Um, don't you need a back? Don't you need that Newton's third law to get a back reaction? But look, imagine that I have, uh, I have an explosion, or I just have. Uh, I just put a lot of, I, I put, okay, so let, let me take a ball of gas and compress it. And then let it expand. Will it expand? Will it accelerate the same mechanism as here? Pressure gradient pushes you out along the streamline. Well, it expands, okay, so well, here's the magnetic field that is in the And so the material is getting the momentum from the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. So internal energy? Magnetic field is internal energy. Yes. And it's going to no, the magnetic field. So the total momentum, the total momentum is conserved. It's just momentum from the field goes into uh, the uh, into the it, into the kinetic energy plasma. Just tr you translate one into the other. You get the uh, energy flux of magnetic field transferred it into energy flux of kinetic energy. You can think of it as transfer of momentum as well. Let me, let me, however, show you some nice, some more nice results uh, before before I run out of time and I have three minutes. Uh, We've been asking lots of questions. Sorry? We've been asking lots of questions. Oh, okay, good, good, good. I'm happy to hear that. Okay, so I wanted to show you. So okay, so this is uh, this is this is the slide that I that uh, I showed you before I, I, I diverted to to the other one, uh, just to make a recap of side by side comparison of these two models. 
this model has gamma times theta 2. Uh, how, does, how do we get 2? Lorentz factor of 100, open angle 0.02, product is 2. This one has Lorentz factor of 500, open angle twice as large, because the open angle can change a little bit, but it cannot change by larger than 1 over gamma. Okay? This, is, this is why it increases by a factor of 2. But these increases by a factor of 5 and a factor of 2 combined give you an increase in the product of a factor of 10. This is how I got to 20 from 2. And magically, I can put a checkbox here because my product is, uh, is an order of tens. So uh, the modeler produces all three of these properties. Can you see again what happens if you completely remove the collimation outside of the star? This is what I do. Uh, I completely remove the collimation outside of the star. Uh, because um, this wall, it, even though it deconfines the jet slowly, you can make it sharper, as I said. if I were to do it sharper, uh, then uh, nothing would change because I mean, the open angle cannot change, as I told you, by more than a factor of two of, of the jet. And uh, as long as I remove confinement from the jet, there is a vacuum there. And so it doesn't matter what the wall does beyond it. So the only change that might be is occurring while the wall is still supporting the jet. And it turns out that's not important, as I will show you in a second, OK? It's, it's not a universal constant. It depends on the jet shape uh, inside the star. And it depends on the initial magnetization of the jet uh, and, uh, and the opening angle. Sorry, no, no, no. Yeah, 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 all, 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 two, all these two things. So the, the shape of the wall, the initial magnetization of the jet, uh, and the opening angle at the stellar surface. Uh, I, will, I will show it to you in a second. Because we have an analytic model of what's going on. Um, so let me, let me guide you through this plot. Uh, what I did now, let me go back in a second, for a second. Uh, what, I, what I will do now is I will take a field line, which is a characteristic field line um, in a jet. Uh, it's a half power field line. Half of the power is inside that field line, and half is outside. This field line turns out to be right in between these two. Uh, and uh, I will plot quantities along this field line. Namely, what I will plot is Lorentz factor along this field line. Uh, this is the Lorentz factor axis. goes from 1 to 1,000. <coughs> And this axis is uh, the radius. Both are in log. Uh, going from 10 to the minus 4 radii of the star, where star is 1, radius of 1, and goes all the way to about 10 to the 6 stellar radii outside of the star. I show you three curves, actually four curves, but let, let me go in steps. So the, the dotted line here, you see the dotted line? You can't see it under the green line, is the original continuously confined model that doesn't work with observations. Uh, we have a full analytic solution for it. So if I were to plot it over the numerical solution, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Um, this model coincides, not surprisingly, with the, with the numerical model that I showed to you on the right, which is the deconfined jet. Because inside the star, the shape of the wall is the same. However, once I start to open up the wall at the surface of the star, uh, then the deconfined model Lorentz factor in the deconfined model jumps up by about a factor of five, from, from 100 to about 500, well, roughly in that ballpark. Uh, however, the fully confined jet continues to slowly accelerate. Now, we also have another model, is a model of a jet that has never been confined, uh, or that it was confined with straight walls all the way from the very start. So what I can do is I can take this open angle, put the walls which will go straight all the way down to the black hole and, and ask myself what the Lorentz factor of that jet would do. And it turns out that it perfectly matches onto the final state of my deconfined jet. So what happens when I remove the walls? The system is shaken up so violently that it totally forgets about what the shape of the wall was or anything that happened to the jet inside the star. It just relaxes to this universal uh, uh, straight jet, monopolar-like jet. Uh, for which we also have an analytic solution that I derived a couple of years ago. Uh, and this is this, this, this is this solution shown uh, with the dashed blue line. You can see uh, the numerical solution for deconfined jet goes from the confined solution, red dotted line, to the deconfined solution. All we don't know is what's happening in this rarefaction of the jet once the wall gets away. Uh, it's, it's a subject of future research. But so far, what I can tell is what happens outside and inside. And this is, this is the only thing we don't know. 
So I have a formula for what happens here, and I can talk to each of you individually who are interested in the technical details. So I can I can tell you that. You have a question? So, so is that saying you're getting higher uh, gammas for the confined jet? I get higher gammas for, confi for confined jets far away asymptotically. Uh, but, but, more but the open angles would be tiny. Because as gamma increases, remember gamma times theta is 1. So if my gamma increases by a factor of 10, then this theta here will be uh, 0.1 degree or 0.01 degree. But weren't you getting higher Lorentz factors in your previous? So initially, initially, I win by opening the jet up. See, initially I win. But then I level off almost, almost immediately. And I explain to you why that is happening qualitatively. I level off. However, the one that's continuously collimating will win eventually. But it will happen at uh, 100 stellar radii if I were to continue these two solutions. So I can tell you why I level off if that's interesting. Or I can answer you other questions if you have. Where is theta equals 1? Sorry? Where is theta equals 1 on your plots? Where theta equals 1? Yeah. Theta, theta e theta gamma. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there is no theta equal one because the opening angle of the you mean one degree or one radian. One radian. Oh, one radian is much larger than my opening angle. My opening angle of the jet here is uh, 0 .0, 0 0.04. It's a uh, one twenty fifth of radian. Uh, I I, I don't, maybe, maybe drawing a picture helps. So this is this is the carton. My jet starts with the opening angle of 90 degrees initially. Uh, then the, and I stretch this direction as well, again. Uh, then it collimates to about opening angle of 0 0.02, 0.02 here. And then it, it remains almost straight, but maybe with slight, slightly extra angle because of the deconfinement. So here, asymptotically, uh, theta becomes 0.04. OK? So one radian would be like this. It's outside of the jet open. So why, why does this happen? I can tell you, but let me conclude. And then I, I, can, I can tell you that, if that's interesting. Or I can talk to you later in detail. Oh, by the way, so we have a full analytic understanding of the jet, uh, as I mentioned. We have two regimes of Lorentz factor um, next to the black hole. First, Lorentz factor grows linearly with distance from the axis. So gamma 1 is some constant, which is proportional to the rotation rate of the central object. Essentially, it's rotational frequency times the distance, cylindrical distance from the axis. Then, slightly further, Lorentz factor goes in a different regime, where it's determined by the curvature, alloidal curvature of field lines. This is because if you're curving, you cannot go too fast, because the centrifugal force will throw you off the track. So the field lines will have to open up. And so here, Lorentz factor is given by the square root of the ratio of the curvature of the field line. It's this curvature in this plane uh, over the distance uh, to the axis, cylindrical distance. And then far away, it goes as logarithm to the one third of distance along the jet, spherical polar distance. That's what you see, this flattening. And there is a clear reason why it has to be changing slowly. Um, OK, so I could derive this, but I won't because I don't have time. And this is my pre-conclusions. So, if you ha want to have a successful model of a gamma ray burst jet, you have to have two components. You have to have confinement and deconfinement. Why is that so? Because a fully confined jet, as I told you, uh, moves slowly for its open angle. That is, the product is less than one. A fully deconfined jet, imagine there is no extra matter outside. The jet is just fanning out radially. Its open angle will be pi over two. Huge, one radian. Um, it's too large. Doesn't work with observations. I think that that conclusion I'm not sure for because your wake at um, gamma theta equals one could either mean that gamma is crossing one and theta is too pi, or pi let's say, in which case you obviously see a break from the transition to a non-relativistic expansion. Right? So that's not that's I'm not sure for. But what I mean is, if I were to say, given the total energy. So. Well, you know the the okay. 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 If I want, if I want my full open angle of the jet to be. Pi over two. Yes. That doesn't work because it's too large, okay? No, that's not that's not large. You know, there's no constraint on that. Okay. If you, so well, maybe what you're saying is that you can say that my outflow is non collimated but you will be looking only a part around the axis. Is that yes, what you're saying? Until gamma goes to one and then you see the whole thing. Oh, 
want to, okay, but then there is a problem, there is too little energy in there. If you want 10 to the 53 ergs released in the small cone, then the total energy release would be orders of magnitude larger. Well, that's not fine, because if, it's, if you really want to explain a really, really energetic GRB, you wouldn't have enough energy. So, sorry. That's, that's, that's a very good... In fact, that's, that's a paper that we also wrote, and uh, I show that such monopolar jets are very good accelerators around the axis. So that's true. But in application to very bright gamma rivers, long gamma rivers, uh, there is not enough energy, full energy. Okay? But that's not the point. My point was very simple, uh, is that if you don't have any confinement, your opening goes large. Okay? Very simple. No more than what I said. So what you have to have is initial confinement to put all that energy into a small open angle that you observe, and then release the walls, uh, remove the stellar envelope, so that this jet can accelerate due to this deconfinement. And then you will get agreement for this product Lorentz factor of Lorentz factor in open angle. So these are the conclusions. Numerical plus analytical models of deconfined jets uh, that uh, extend over 10 orders of magnitude and uh, reach Lorentz factors of 500 which is a very realistic Lorentz factor. This is, uh, by the way, the largest Lorentz factor achieved in numerical magnetohydrodynamic simulation uh, to date. Uh, just outside of the star, a magnetohydrodynamic jet undergoes uh, a period of rapid acceleration where its Lorentz factor increases by almost an order of magnitude, but opening angle stays almost the same. Uh, this uh, makes you, this brings you into agreement with uh, observations that require the product of Lorentz factor and open angle to be much larger than one. On the contrary, if the jet is continuously confined, you don't get agreement with observations. And the future work, which would be very interesting, is to see how this simple picture um, gets modified if instead of the wall, I actually propagate this jet through an actual stellar envelope uh, with all the instability of the interface in full three dimensions. That would be very exciting. Thank you very much. You are implicitly having a very sharp break in, uh, in gamma, right, at the, uh, at the boundary of the jet between pi gamma and, and essentially gamma unity. Are you talking about uh, uh, the distance? Just across, this, this across this boundary here, right? And if one had a smooth transition in gamma, you had a cocoon. So you, you go smoothly from gamma to 100 near the core, to gamma of 10 and 5 and 2. Then it's true that the faster gamma material will eventually leave behind the lower gamma material, but it does so only gradually. You know, I mean, it'll leave behind the gamma two material very quickly, but but in between those two, there would be, in principle, some intermediate <coughs> material where, which would keep up with it longer. Right. Okay. So in that case, the principle of it seems a little bit less clear. A principle of what? The principle of the deconfinement acceleration. Seems uh, so on the one hand, yes. On the other hand, once you don't have any confinement, then the flow becomes radial, and that's all I need. I need radial flow. Well, it's just that if you have a continuous rate of gamma, it's not clear if you, if you still can in principle have some confinement. Um, yeah, I thought about this a lot. I thought about this a lot. Let's maybe, maybe talk maybe about maybe. this later. Yeah. Yeah. So you showed the most factors given kind of magnetization Trying to use the sigma of one third, you need what, 10 to 15 gauss in order to get 500? So, yeah, 10 to 15 gauss is, is good enough, I think. Uh, but uh, what matters here is you only talk about absolute magnitude of magnetic field only in application to the total energy release. If you, because total energy is proportional, total energy released or the power of the jet is proportional to the magnetic field strength at the base squared. Uh, and that's that's the only thing that that it, well, that this reflects. Yeah, if I use sigma to the one third, I need 10 to 15 gauss. Anything that's. What, what do you mean sigma to the one third? The if you use sigma to the one third. Gamma infinity goes as uh, magnetization, which is Mitchell's Michael or Mitchell's scale, whichever way you want to call it. That scaling doesn't apply to these collimating jets. Right. So it would be even more, you know, it would be even stronger if it's trained on magnetization of the source. If you need to get one spectrum of thousand. I just want to get an idea. So if so, so what what you're saying is, if we get so first of all, um, what determines the the Lorentz factor 
far away. This is the same figure, but I took away the, the blue dashed line and I added magnetization here. Um, so this is Lorentz factor, this is magnetization, and there is their product essentially, which is uh, the Bernoulli parameter of the field line. I cannot jump over the uh, maximum Lorentz factor that the field line can carry uh, energetically. And this is for this field line is like 1,000 here, 900. Uh, so what happens is, as magnetization decreases, as magnetic energy is converted into kinetic energy, Lorentz factor increases. And it turns out there is nothing special that's happening at gamma equal to this maximum Lorentz factor, the one, the one third, that's what you were telling me. This happens at this point. You see Lorentz factor continues to go as one single power law, not knowing anything about this. It turns out that what you're mentioning, what Michael's uh, sigma to the one third problem, is only happening near the midplane for these field lines that are not collimating. For these ones, it, the problem is not there. Um, you can go through that point without any problem. And uh, what you end up with is you end up at the partition. So uh, this magnetization asymptotically of the jet, uh, for instance, in this simulation that I showed you, is one. So you start with 1,000. But since you reached a, a Lorentz factor of 500, then you've gotten to magnetization, which is 1,000 over 500 or so. It's, it's, it's unity. OK? So, so you see goes down and gamma goes up, right? That's what you yes. see again. Yes. You just completely counterintuitive. But then, at the end, I understand the behavior. When sigma reaches a certain asymptotic value, then your gamma reaches. This is what we call multiplied dimensional. Yeah, scaling, so this, right? this, you get to Michael scaling, but it's offset. Uh, it's, uh, there is yeah, a huge. The results. If you take the grand Schaffernock equations, right? Yes. You prescribe magnetic flux or magnetic flux distribution with a certain radial formation of infinity. Okay. You get this modified Michael scaling where sigma goes, uh, sorry, gamma infinity goes to sigma, instead of sigma one. Gamma infinity goes to sigma infinity to the power 1.01, whatever. So I, I, th there might be confusion between sigma, which is a local value, along the jet, it changes. It's large at the base and small at yeah. the outside. And initial sigma, which is this value, it's 1,000. If I have very initial sigma, if I increase it, then the Lorentz factor far away also increases, OK? That's maybe, that's maybe what, what, what you're thinking about. Um, but I don't prescribe the field line shape. You can prescribe the field line shape and ask what will happen. But that's not, not consistent. What I do, I solve for the fully self-consistent solution. And I determine what the Lorentz factor is. And uh, maybe in agreement with the, with the models that prescribe the field line shape, if they do show this, uh, then I have this flattening far away. This is, uh, this, is this, uh, this is a result of the following. I don't know if I have time to show this, but there is, there is a difference, and you guys feel free to go because uh, I'm far away. Well, I think once you just, if you give this last answer, then we'll yeah. stop. So why, why do I have this flattening of Lorentz factor far away? Maybe that's what you're asking about. Yeah. Uh, so this is a, an intrinsically magnetical, magnetical phenomenon. Uh, if it was a hydrodynamic flow that was expanding to do its own pressure, it would go all the way up to the maximum Lorentz factor it can get. So it would uh, go up to this curve. However, in magnetic case, there is not only pressure that is a force that's acting. There is also so-called hoop stress, this, uh, the, uh, the tension of these loops. And so what happens is um, these loops, even though they want to push themselves out due to the pressure gradient, they also want to try to squish back uh, due to the hoop stress. And uh, this is what happens. You have a loop. This is the direction of, uh, of propagation of this loop. It's slightly opening up right, at a certain angle. Uh, there is a hoop stress uh, that, is, uh, that is trying to push together this toroidal field loop. And there is a pressure gradient uh, that is uh, pushing you out and accelerating you. And uh, the dynamics is determined by these two forces, the, prop, the, uh, the projection of the hoop stress onto the direction of motion and the pressure gradient along the motion. Uh, it turns out that this hoop stress becomes progressively less important as you get towards the axis. And you can see this angle becomes close to 90 degrees, and this progression, projection of hoop stress becomes very small. So you accelerate it mostly by the pressure gradient. However, if I draw the same picture for the Michaels type of problem, where my velocity is horizontal in the midplane, then the pressure gradient and the hoop stress, they are counterbalancing each other. And this counterbalancing occurs much earlier than in this case. 
This is why this flow is inefficient. Yeah, we can talk more about this. You know, this is a fish point transition from spherical to non-spherical and to a space. I can show you that we have done Sure. That. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.